This is John Gay with the John Quincy Adams Society. We've got a special audio treat for you now, a session from our conversation last week with Stephen Mortime on the liberal international order and whether we truly can speak of something called the liberal international order. Is there really one liberal international order that's out there? I apologize if the audio quality is not the same as it used to be. This was recorded uh, from the stage uh, at our conference last week, our summer conference in Washington, D.C., with about 75 students from all over the country in attendance. I just wanted to talk today, but, you know, we're going a little big picture here. You know, we, we focused in our previous sessions on some very specific kind of fine-tuned issues or particular countries. And now we're going to zoom out and talk big picture. So we're going to talk about the liberal international order. And our guest is Stephen Mortime, who is a senior fellow in the American Statecraft Program at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. He's a historian of U.S. foreign policy and international order and writes widely about contemporary problems in American grand strategy. His Ph.D. is from Columbia. So you have a, a history Ph.D. When in your studies did you start to encounter this term, liberal international order, rules-based international order? Where were, you, where were you seeing this? All right. Well, first of all, it's a real pleasure to be with you. I want to thank you for uh, running JQAS. Uh, and thanks to Ryan for inviting me to speak. The only problem I have with the John Quincy Adams Society is that it wasn't around when I was in college. So you're putting me on the spot here. I have to make a confession that I did uh, an undergraduate degree in history, studying the history of U.S. foreign policy and international relations. I did a Ph.D., in history, studying the history of U.S. foreign policy and international relations. And all this time, I don't believe I heard once of the liberal international order or the U.S.-led post-war rules-based international order. Maybe it appeared in passing in a couple things I might have read, but nobody asked me about it in general exams. Uh, there were no tomes on the subject written that the, the, the birth of the U.S.-led rules-based international order in World War II. That book doesn't exist, or it didn't exist. It still doesn't exist. So I felt pretty stupid when all of a sudden, around 2015, 2016, I had just gotten my degree, and suddenly I was hearing from dozens of analysts and commentators and political figures that uh, the, the U.S.-led post-war liberal international order was under threat, as if this was some obvious thing that any literate person would know. So I was tempted to uh, invoice my uh, alma maters uh, and receive a, a hefty refund for my tuition, but I did think the better of it. And I think what this goes to show is that uh, it was perfectly possible to study all the th seeming things that are encapsulated by the idea of the U.S.-led post-war liberal international order, U.S. foreign policy, American hegemony, uh, international ideas, rules, alliances, institutions, without using this concept. So it's been a recent choice to use this particular concept, which has turned into a meme. Yeah, when did, when did people start talking about this, and what are they kind of saying when they say, this is what exists? So only in the past decade or so um, has uh, this concept of the liberal or rules-based international order come into widespread usage. Uh, in the New York Times, in the, uh, in the aughts, the phrase liberal international order and rules-based international order uh, appeared, each of them appeared once, one time in the entire decade of the 2000s. Uh, if you search NATO's website, the first appearance of the term uh, comes in 2010, 
uh, in a document, and that referred to the rule-based international order, singular rule, and referred to the United Nations as if NATO, that was more the United Nations job than it was of NATO. Well, this year alone, so far, the New York Times has 13 articles, according to a search of its website, uh, that contain the phrase rules-based international order, including an op-ed by President Biden. And indeed, the rules-based international order is a favorite phrase uh, of this administration. Uh, It has appeared in uh, just a series of speeches and statements uh, issued by the U.S. in conjunction with G7, NATO. If you check the NATO strategic concept that just came out, there's a lot of rules-based international order there, uh, even uh, with the statement uh, that Biden made at the uh, the GCC uh, last week. So what is this claim? If I'm skeptical of this claim, let's be a little clear about what it is. Uh, And I think uh, Secretary of State Tony Blinken did a good job uh, of summarizing what people are talking about when they invoke the liberal or rules-based international order. Uh, And here's how he defined it in his big speech in May on China policy. Uh, He said, quote, we must defend and reform the rules-based international order, the system of laws, agreements, principles, and institutions that the world came together to build after two world wars to manage relations between states, to prevent conflict, to uphold the rights of all people. So there's a lot there. Uh, I think there are three key aspects uh, of this concept that are there in in Blinken's single line definition. First of all, the rules-based international order is a kind of unified system. He uses the word system. It's not just a hodgepodge of different things, uh, different laws, rules, institutions. Uh, It's not, we would like to see a, some kind of world based on rules. It is the, the, rules-based international order. There's only one of them, and it's everywhere. Uh, This order also has a liberal or rules-based character, and it has a particular history. There's a narrative embedded in this, right, that goes back to, as Blinken says, uh, after two world wars. That's why the phrase post-war appears. So We have basically two points in time in this narrative, the origin around World War II, and then the present where the order is under threat. Uh, And this is what you see if you analyze uh, this this phrase and how it's invoked by uh, commentators and political figures. Those are, I think, common elements that you see. So this is pretty important stuff. It's expressing a lot about how the United States uh, sees itself and its purpose in, in the world. So do you think that it's then not accurate or useful to understand the history of US foreign policy or the history of contemporary international relations as the history of the liberal international order? Because you, know, you could say, like, maybe Maybe people have started talking about it because we were like fish in water. It just existed, and we didn't really need a label for it. And now it's kind of being challenged, and so we talk about it a lot more. That's right. Not all new phrases are inaccurate. So that that, that alone doesn't tell us whether we should or should not use this vocabulary. Uh, the problem for me is it's really – unclear what the definition of the liberal international order is, what exactly is inside of it, what's not, uh, how can we verify or falsify its existence or whether a country is an upholder of the order or a threat to that order. So first of all, the, the term accurate, which you used, it's hard to know whether it's accurate or not um, or, w- or what that could mean in the absence of some criteria. That doesn't seem to be what's going on here. Instead, there's an assumption there's definitely this order. Uh, And if you just think about history, uh, the history of the alleged order and some of the most salient aspects of it, it seems hard for me to see how it would be useful 
to think in these terms. So let's put accuracy aside for just a minute and think about what would the utility of the concept be analytically? What does it help us see? What does it help us do? Now, at the outset of uh, the alleged liberal international order, things changed considerably. Are we talking about 1945 being the origin of the liberal international order or say 1948 or 49? Um, what happened? The Cold War happened. This is a profound shift. Uh, in 1945, the United States helped to set up universal institutions like the United Nations, the Bretton Woods monetary system in which every country would be a member. It did that in part because the hope was that the great powers, including the Soviet Union, would be able to essentially cooperate in the post-war world. And within two, three, four, five years, the Cold War began, and instead some profoundly new institutions were created, such as NATO in 1949, uh, to many supporters of the one world concept of 1945, this divided Cold War world looked like a contradiction. And it, it was to a substantial degree. That's why not everybody was for NATO. Would it have solved anything if actors at the time had said, well, what we want to do, guys and gals, is, is create a liberal world order? It's hard to see how. Um, which is more liberal? Is it the universalism of the 1945 vision? Or is it the Cold War of 1948, 49, um, in which the free world is dividing itself from the illiberal communist world and attempting to contain communism? Each of those could plausibly be described as liberal. So invoking the concept doesn't get you anything, doesn't help you explain what happened at the time, and it wouldn't have helped you at the time to think through that, that concept. And just another example, and there are innumerable, is that the Bretton Woods uh, monetary system just completely collapsed in the 1970s. Um, uh, we now have floating exchange rates. The whole point of the Bretton Woods system at the beginning was to have fixed exchange rates, because those were thought to be necessary uh, to enable trade, and there was a whole uh, uh, complex arrangement uh, in which the U.S. dollar was, was tied to gold and other currencies were tied to the dollar. It's completely gone. So the idea of this single liberal international order birthed somewhere around 1945, marching through time and space, is really hard to make sense of, uh, for me, from a, from a historical perspective. And so what about rules-based then, you know, the, the Biden administration has talked a lot about upholding uh, a rules-based order, about a U.S.-led rules-based order. Yeah. Does, does that kind of idea make sense from a historical perspective? So I think the claim here is not so much that, um, you know, the rules substitute for power. Rules are self-enforcing. That would be fairly, I think, easy to, to refute, but it's a more sophisticated claim that um, power in this system has enforced rules. Power has been put behind rules, and the power mainly refers to the, that of the United States uh, and presumably its allies in there as well. Um, so that's a sophisticated claim. It's hard to know how to operationalize that claim. Um, I don't think it's verifiable and falsifiable uh, because there's circularity. Uh, leading states in the international system are going to shape the content of the rules and institutions according to what they think benefits them. And so you can expect them to follow those rules and, and participate in those institutions a fair amount of the time and that might not happen all the time. So if we find you know, compliance, is that really a rules-based international order? And of course, we don't find compliance all the time. Um, so again, 
we're not in the realm of something that I think we can say accurate or inaccurate. But on another level, it's maybe misleading, right? It actually is mystifying, makes it harder to understand what actually happened in history if we use this concept. Uh, because if you look at what the architects of, for example, the United Nations saw themselves doing in World War II, um, they were actually trying to move away from the rules-based order, if you like, that the previous generation had attempted to set up. So the concept of the post-war rules-based order would have us think that before then there was anarchy. Um, after then, rules started to matter and there was an order. But the League of Nations was actually a thing <laughs> that was set up after World War I. Uh, and precisely because it was so rule-based, the U.S. didn't end up joining. Uh, it required all member states uh, under Article 10 to come to the defense of any other state that was attacked by an aggressor to secure their sovereignty and territorial integrity. This is the main sticking point for the U.S. Senate. Now, that's a rules-based system, and there were other ideas that were very much in vogue at the time uh, to have states agree to settle their legal disputes in an international court and perhaps enforce the rulings of that court. The UN was created uh, as a repudiation of those visions. The planners of the UN wanted a flexible body uh, that imposed no obligations on members to do anything unless they voted for it, specifically unless the Security Council on which there were five permanent members with veto power agreed to vote for it. Uh, so it left discretion to the great powers in particular. Uh, and uh, if you look at chapter five of my book, I show evidence that even before the ink was dry on the UN Charter, some of the uh, main drafters and proponents of it, uh, Leo Pazvolsky, John Foster Dulles, uh, Senator Arthur Vandenberg, they were already thinking of how the United States might find it uh, expedient to use force even if it is unable to obtain uh, the approval of uh, the UN Security Council. In other words, extra legally in violation of the very legal system that they were putting into place at the time. They were already thinking ahead to that possibility and de definitely not rejecting that possibility. So rules-based order seems uh, from a certain sense to get backwards uh, what was actually happening uh, in, in 1945. So if, if, this, if these kind of set of ideas distort history, why do you think they're so popular, especially right now? Yeah, I think the, uh, in, in short, it's ideology. Um, this is a story that uh, Americans want to tell about themselves. Um, there's a grain of truth to the story that the U.S. has for a long time seen itself as ordering the world um, and trying to build a world that is based on rules and not just its own arbitrary power. Um, that is a longstanding um, aspiration in U.S. rhetoric, and I'm not just saying that it's rhetoric. I think it's sincerely believed by policymakers. Um, the thing is, though, that the U.S. had that aspiration well before World War II, um, at least dating back to the progressive era. Uh, there was a desire to order the world and order other countries, including colonies that the United States held. So then the question is, why date the liberal international order to the post-war era only? Why does that seem intuitively um, comfortable? And I think that's because what we're really talking about without talking about it, when we talk about the liberal international order, we're talking about American privacy. We're talking about American globalism. That's the thing that has its origins around World War II and has continued 
up to the present. It hasn't been that international law suddenly began then, international institutions suddenly began then, and so forth. So pulling this into the present then, what does it matter uh, if policymakers, commentators, et cetera, are operating uh, under assumptions that the LIO is real or uh, that this is something that they need to uphold or, or what, what does it do? So I think the answer that we have to look at, what is it, what, what are its targets? What is the liberal international order or rules-based international order being invoked against? Uh, and as I look at the history of this, the recent history, I see two big targets uh, for this language. Uh, Donald Trump and China. Uh, so let's take Trump, because I think when the liberal international order becomes something like a household term, you know, something that could be uttered on, on CNN, it's really in the context of um, fears expressed about Donald Trump standing against the post-war US-led liberal international order. The phrase does have uses trickling up before then, which is significant, but it explodes, I think, um, uh, as a way of casting Trump as beyond the pale, outside the accepted legitimate traditions of US foreign policy that date to uh, the, the post-war era, and therefore suggesting that he is something from outside of that history. Maybe he's an, an isolationist or something from prior to the war, um, and a threat to the war. Um, it's also a vocabulary that I think is useful to critics of Trump because it allows them to defend a status quo that's being questioned, that's under strain, without really having to specify, well, exactly what are they defending? And exactly what is Donald Trump, in their view, threatening? Um, you know, George W. Bush was not called an opponent of the liberal international order or the rules-based international order during his presidency. Um, why is that? Now, he was criticized for violating international law and any number of other things, domestic, you know, but not this. So I, th I think uh, part of the issue is that, that Trump was rhetorically questioning some of the verities of US foreign policy, including free trade, um, but I think what Trump does differently, it's not unilateralism, we're used to unilateralism. It's that Trump was seeming to question US hegemony sometimes uh, by questioning what the purpose of NATO was, for example. That was different about Trump. That's not what we see from, from George W. Bush. And so again, I think this language is a way of, Americans don't like to talk about American primacy, American hegemony. So talking about a threat to the liberal international order is an indirect way of doing that without actually naming what the conversation truly is. So what about China then? You mentioned that. Right. So China, um, also really important um, in this story. And the formulation of rules-based here, I think, is, um, is used more often uh, in, in, in reference to China, perhaps because some of the uh, U.S. allies and partners against China um, aren't liberal, uh, and also perhaps because there's a desire to um, make it seem like there is an order out there that China could be part of, even if it's not um, going to become something other than led by the Chinese Communist Party, um, that unfortunately in practice China is said to be a threat to. Um, so the Biden administration in particular 
has heavily used the language of the rules-based order to express its objectives vis-a-vis China, much more so than the Trump administration did, Um, talking about China as a threat or more often a challenge to the rules-based order. And I think part of the aim is actually to try to avoid um, a kind of total Cold War framework. Uh, something that the Biden administration, the, the president and uh, Secretary of State Blinken have said they, they really want to avoid. The problem is, um, is that really possible while also casting China as a outright um, revisionist power, a, a, a threat or challenge to the rules-based order? Part of the problem is that the rules-based order is undefinable, so it gives the United States license to object to Chinese activities and influence pretty much anywhere, as long as they can be plausibly cast as challenging a norm, a law, a rule, an institution, um, lo- you know, lowering standards, etc. That applies to a whole range of things. Uh, One of the main complaints about Chinese activity uh, is uh, its uh, maritime activities and claims in the South China Sea, uh, which uh, violate the uh, UN Convention on the Law of the Sea. This is something the United States uh, hasn't ratified itself, and yet somehow we can continue to think this is good evidence that the United States upholds and stands for the rules-based order China is Uh, dead set against it. The other problem, I think, with this concept as something that is meant to avoid an all-out Cold War is that it's mutually unintelligible with Beijing. There's no way that Chinese leaders can accept a characterization of China as outright opposed to the world's order. Um, So it's, it's something that we cannot have real diplomacy uh, on the basis of. Um, We also can't make meaningful accommodations to a country that we regard as a threat to the world's order. Um, That would seem to be, uh, politically, that will immediately be attacked in this country as, you know, threatening the rules-based order and therefore contradicting what the same president Um, has been saying all along. Uh, So I think this is essentially a concept of a security dilemma that's actually helping to bring the security dilemma about or a concept of of the Cold War. There's a political scientist, uh, Alistair Ian Johnson, who actually takes the emergence of the phrase rules-based order as a proxy uh, for the uh, security dilemma uh, between the United States and China. So Biden was at the uh, the Gulf Cooperation Council for a meeting last week and referenced the rules-based order several times, and I'm, I'm curious what you made of that. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's, it's quite something to be able to um, uh, thank, uh, thank our Saudi hosts uh, in one breath and then uh, say that the United States is uh, committing itself uh, to the region, to its partners in the region. Uh, because they share a common vision of the rules-based order. Um, I think, again, we see that this concept allows uh, policymakers to be able to avoid having to um, explain the particular choices, the particular policy choices that they're making. Um, Instead of saying, this is the value of a close security partnership with Saudi Arabia, Uh, What the president, in effect, did was say, well, there's some more general value called upholding this rules-based international order that we're all getting out of this. Now, how do you connect the dots from the security partnership with Saudi Arabia to the rules-based international order? That's something I can't tell you. Yeah, so, you know, if you're talking to someone who does by the idea of a, of a liberal international order, such as like a whole lot of policymakers, uh, how would you engage with them? I would say uh, get concrete. So the, the liberal international order concept is a way of 
not grappling with the real choices and trade-offs that we face. And so I think the best way to deal with this, whether whether you try to you know, frontally attack the liberal international order concept as I have done today, uh, or not, because this is ideology, you, you're not going to talk somebody out of ideology, uh, is to just ask for concreteness, for specificity in the, in the claims. So again, how does a security connect the dots for me <laughs> from uh, partnering uh, with Riyadh uh, to the rules-based order? Show me the work, the math on that. Um, or if you, you know, f- face a more difficult policy problem like Taiwan, um, you know, should the United States commit to defend Taiwan uh, against uh, a Chinese attack? Um, well, one might say that uh, doing so would uphold the liberal international order or the rules-based international order. On the other hand, if you think through the consequences of going to war with China over Taiwan, that will be damaging to many things that are supposed to be part of the liberal or rules-based international order in addition to U.S. interests. Uh, it will shatter the U.N. system. It will inhibit Chinese cooperation on whole range of issues, Iran, North Korea, et cetera. So you can simply pit these elements of the so-called order against themselves and then ask for, okay, so here's the real choice. Now what do we do? And that puts this this concept uh, to the side. Uh, so I think the key is to try to avoid sanctifying the status quo, which this concept is trying to do, uh, and you know have a real discussion. Uh, about uh, what our what our choices are. So one last one for me, and then we'll sure. start taking questions from the audience. You know, what what about this? You know, so maybe you know you're right, and the liberal international order or rules based international order kind of doesn't exist. But it would still seem that it sort of exists, like exists a bit, or exists in partial, fragmentary ways, mm-hmm. and. You could say, okay, so so it's not perfect, but you're never going to achieve perfection in the world of politics, domestic or international, that this is probably the best we can do compared to many other orders and that therefore we ought to defend it. Mm-hmm. Well, I'm just not sure what the it is. <laughs> so just on a very basic level, right, look at our security arrangements in Europe. NATO, a highly institutionalized collective defense organization. Uh, In the Middle East, more informal security partnerships, much more with the liberal actors. In East Asia, uh, bilateral uh, bilateral alliances. So it's not even sort of clear what's the, you know, what's the it that unifies these various things. I think if we're talking about American hegemony, then we can have a discussion about, is that the best we can do? Um, though we may not be able to sustain the same degree of dominance uh, going forward that we've, that we've had in, in, in recent decades. Um, but I think, uh, you know, with respect to having an orderly world or uh, a basically liberal world, that's a question that has to come down in the in the in the details of because so many uh, different rules and arrangements and institutions are qualitatively different or even contradict each other, we just cannot have the discussion on the basis of thinking that there's a single order out there uh, that is highly coherent. So let's start for questions in this section. Oh, okay, okay. I want to read one of my favorite rules in the Gulf of Explorer, which is Article 2.4 of the United Nations Charter. All members shall refrain in their international relations from the threat or use of force against the territorial integrity or political independence of any state. And, you know, I would suggest that that's a pretty clear rule. And the problem with American policy is that we flagrantly disregard it. Let's see, Panama in 1989, uh, Iraq in 2003, Kosovo in 1999, Libya in 2011. Really, the whole war on terror 
basically flagrantly regarded the territorial integrity and political independence of states. That's true also of our allies in the Middle East, the Israelis, and next to all the nines. Bombs, Syria, right here, right here. Saudi Arabia has conducted this war in Yemen again in flagrant violation of that rule. So, I'd like to take away from your excellent remarks about the ambiguities and the ways in which it's been used, but there is a, there is a kind of basic rule here that, um, you know, we should observe. Now, it does seem to me that one should distinguish between observing a rule oneself and threatening to go to war with any state that disregards it. That really is a separate question. And we have an obligation uh, with the existence of nuclear weapons to avoid Armageddon and catastrophe for the planet. And so uh, indiscriminate threats of force on our part, even to enforce a good rule, may be highly improved. But you know, it is ironic that if you look at the speeches of Russia and China, they, they appealed the charter. And uh, we used to appeal the charter, but as I say, it does seem to me, I, I kind of put this proposition to you, that the, 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 more, the more fundamental problem with American policy is hypocrisy with regard to the observance of that basic rule, rather than obscurity with regard to that principle. Uh, forbidding aggression. Good. So I I share your your complaint. Mm -hmm. And so to be clear, I object to the concept of the liberal or rules based international order as it's commonly invoked. Not because I think um, laws, rules, norms, institutions are unimportant, but because I think they are important. And so actually, this particular, they're so important that you can't encapsulate them by this single overarching concept that ignores uh, how, they, how there are real choices to be made, how some of them contradict each other. So why isn't, for example, George W. Bush cast as an opponent of the liberal international order? After all, he's in a very spectacular way uh, with a lot of politics surrounding it. Uh, went to war against Iraq in violation of the UN Charter. Um, well, I think that we don't find it plausible because arguably he violated part of the liberal international order, the part that you and I find to be very important, to do something that was also liberal and international ordery, and that was trying to democratize the Middle East. So the concept actually can be invoked against international law. And that's part of the problem that I have with it. Um, we could talk about what parts of international law, rules, and so forth we think are more important than others. Uh, but I think we actually find our efforts thwarted uh, by, by this uh, particular concept of the liberal international order. So over here, we've got Josh in the back corner right there. Thank you. Uh, okay, so when we talk about the uh, liberation national order, I think a lot of, a lot of folks on the political part and the economic part as well. And why do I say this? And I want to talk about there are three components I believe is the economics, the politics, and also really the liberal internationalism. Uh, over the years of between South America, we see how we go to those countries and we like, you know, we see a case where the people that a uh, uh, true democratic process, which is a leader, but we place the economic position plus a leader that's down on the US, we kind of top it up and go with a dictator. So with that in mind, when we talk about the international legal order, is the truly an international legal order or just an international legal order that favors, you know, the, the famous Western powers alone? And just reference a case in South America whereby you know, we have a, 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 we have a government a function democracy because I mean, if they're a socialist or a communist state, we just go in there, you know, coup d'etats and like, you know, put in a dictator that doesn't really promote basically the rest of the people. So back to my question is, why we really do we talk about the international legal order? Is it really, is, is it, do we really follow that to the latter or just really so long as it's an international legal order that favors the, the West? 
another prime example is uh, the Saudis, which I don't know. Uh, MBS does terror fits, you know, with the assassination of the Washington Post journalist, right? That was a terror fit happened. But yet we're willing to ignore that because of oil, because uh, of you know, um, the military importance of Saudi Arabia in the Middle East. But yet we have Venezuela, right? We don't really, you know, we just let, we, we don't talk about Saudi Arabia, but we tend to like uh, um, attack what's going on in Venezuela, what's going on in Iran today. So I was trying to like see what your take is about how the quote unquote international order is it truly, truly a good thing or is it more of like a way for the Western powers to advance the growth of the goals across the globe? Yeah, so the only uh, objection I, I have to the to the framing of the question is that there's some true international liberal liberal international order there, right? Uh, and so what's the true one? There is, it doesn't exist. There, there, there are various arrangements. So by one standard human rights, right, we could have a discussion about how, you know, how and where the United States actually promotes human rights and, and uh, abuses human rights or enables abuses of human rights. That's a thing. Human rights is a thing. <laughs> uh, that I understand. Uh, but we've also coded alliances somehow as part of a constituent part of the liberal international order. So a U.S. alliance with Saudi Arabia, I guess, could be said to be part of the liberal international order, even though human rights are also supposed to be part of the liberal international order. So which, again, which is it? It's just too indeterminate to work with. Now, if we're talking about power, uh, power politics, yes, this is clearly a, an important uh, vocabulary that helps the United States advance claims domestically about what it's doing in the world and is effective internationally. Um, and the war in Ukraine is a really good example uh, of how we've seen um, the United States and its, um, and its allies and partners in this effort advance very strong views as to um, uh, why Ukraine should be supported and Russia should be sanctioned and, and isolated on the basis of Russia's violation of um, the UN Charter uh, as well as its autocratic attack on democracy. These are two different kind of claims that the administration are making. But it's been quite striking to see um, exactly uh, which states were willing to join this coalition and which have not. And I think this starts to get to what you're saying is that there's a, a kind of global north, transatlantic and transpacific uh, set of alliances that when the chips are down, that seems to actually be what, what people are talking about when they talk about the world or the liberal international order or the international community. Uh, it's very much traceable to uh, Cold War alliances uh, which have expanded a, a, a bit since the Cold War, uh, whereas the, the Global South, uh, for a whole host of reasons which you might talk about in the next section, uh, it has not seen uh, you know, Russia's invasion as something that rises to the level where they want to participate in sanctions against Russia or uh, material support for, for Ukraine. So there do seem to be some divergent um, configurations of power um, that uh, that have a clear history uh, that, that date back a number of decades. Right, let's go in the middle. Uh, if either of you, have you asked questions before this conference? Anybody who hasn't gotten one? Okay, there you go. Um, thank you, Professor Levine. I uh, was interested in kind of um, looking at the intellectual ties with what you're talking about with rules-based the world order, and that it seems to elicit a very, like, particular conception of the past, domestically and internationally. It reminds me of, like, a return to normalcy you often hear people talk about, but, like, a conception of a golden age. But I was interested in terms of, like, American primacy, how it might then be related to, um, like, kind of the inevitability of um, capitalist democracy that came with history with uh, Francis Fukuyama, and that there's this directionality in the way in which we talk about democratic backslides. Um, and then there's also kind of, like, similar parallel with, um, how we talk about Ukraine is it as this incident, the war in Ukraine is this instance of um, another war in Europe, like harkening back to World War II. Um, do you think that there there's an intellectual relation between like democratic backslide, mm. or in World War II again, to um, the liberal liberal rules based order? That's a great question. Um, 
I think there's certainly a um, historical teleology built into this concept of the rules-based or liberal international order. It's a kind of fundamentalist appeal, right, to go back to this pristine founding moment, which we've decided doesn't have anything to do with the founding of the United States, um, but dates to World War II, right, when we got things right. And then we define what we got right at various points um, as our reading of, you know, what came out of World War II. Um, so I do think that uh, these references to kind of World War III and um, the return of war in Europe certainly carry with them the sense that history is moving backwards and uh, Russia is the agent that is moving history backwards to a point where there wasn't a rules-based order. There was chaos and anarchy, and all this led to um, world wars, right? And so that's part of the imaginary of why Ukraine matters so much um, to the Biden administration or proponents of what the United States is, is doing there. Um, so I think that's a really, uh, really smart insight because I, one of the things that's so striking is uh, less than a year ago, uh, the president announced that the United States did not have vital interests implicated in a potential war in Ukraine. This is around December uh, and therefore was ruling out the use of force. And although the United States has you know, not entered the war um, and is trying to find ways to limit its involvement and uh, avoid serious escalation risks, nevertheless, the actions that have been taken are quite dramatic and costly. Uh, and the emotional investment um, suggested by the rhetoric of uh, American political leaders is immense. So I think what you're pointing to helps us account for um, for the the level of investment in this in this conflict that we see, which strikes a lot of people as, as obvious as we watch day to day. But I think historians uh, 20 years from now will will be having a vibrant debate about why exactly that was. Why did the United States um, care care so much? One more over in this section. If anybody has any questions, or looks like not. All right, Hunter. Um, yeah, Walter, well, thank you so much for your time uh, here today. Um, so, in uh, hearing your talk today, I, I generally agree. I believe with your characterization of the uh, liberal international order and how it's been used and uh, generally talked about. Um, but let's say, should there be a more limited scope term used, whether it is uh, a version of liberal international order or something entirely new uh, that does encompass those specific international laws that are generally deemed high importance and vital by, let's just say, the majority of people generally consider the norms. Uh, is there a benefit to kind of creating uh, that space? Would that uh, help combat the uh, negative effects of the you know, term that is currently being used as a liberal international order? Or is something like that just kind of doomed to like uh, flagrant misuse or failure because of the, of the way that people use terms? Well, if you could come up with a good definition, the answer is kind of like by definition, yes, that would be good, that would be fine. But what is it? <laughs> and then we would we would have to get into the nitty gritty there. Um, it is notable. I mean, in the past, um, world order is a term that was used by uh, the um, people who set up the United Nations. Um, it's been invoked, if you think about the Gulf War coalition that George H.W. Bush helped to assemble, world order was part of that. I think it, it's quite different from the liberal international order because it doesn't necessarily say that everything around us is part of the one singular interconnected order. Um, but you know, to take the example of the Gulf War, um, the the main argument was that uh, cross-border aggression uh, is a grave uh, problem for the international community. It's something that all states who value their sovereignty and territorial integrity have a stake in defending. Uh, and 
on that basis, uh, the administration was able to assemble a pretty diverse and robust coalition uh, to expel Iraqi forces from Kuwait. Um, I think something like that model would have served the Biden administration much better than what it did um, in the wake of Russia's invasion on February 24th. Uh, what the Biden administration did, although they did sometimes emphasize how Russia had um, violated the UN Charter, um, the most uh, prominent argument, to on, on my reading at least, was that uh, the Russians had uh, launched an attack against democracy and the free world. And so effectively what uh, the administration was doing was asking countries to engage in an open-ended struggle against autocratic powers, including Russia and China, who aren't going anywhere and aren't gonna not become autocratic uh, for the foreseeable future rather than to defend the particular um, uh, norm law against uh, the use of force uh, in an aggressive manner without sanction by the UN Security Council. Had they made that argument, uh, perhaps, perhaps a wider coalition uh, might have been forthcoming to, to support Ukraine, or at least I think it would have put China and Russia in a difficult spot um, since they're being quite hypocritical um, when it comes to their longstanding support for sovereignty, except in this quite spectacular case uh, of, of the war in Ukraine. So I don't think that that kind of argument requires elaborate concepts. Um, but if you want to talk about world order, like a world that's basically <laughs> has order in that sense, that's fine with me, right? If you want to talk about international law, that's fine with me. Um, I would just, I think the point I want to want to really get across here is that the rules-based or liberal international order, that concept is quite different, um, quite, a, quite a different thing altogether. All right, well, with that, that's all the time we have. Thank you, Dr. Wertheim. And uh, we'll be back in about six or seven minutes.